So I'm very, very happy to introduce and welcome Karen Williams. Thank the Alliance for uh, hosting this series of events. An honor to be here at the beginning, uh, very first one, the kickoff one. So thank you very much. Um, a little bit about our agency, 201 Orange County, um, is an easy to use referral service. As Pastor Mark just mentioned, it's a place where people can go when they're looking for resources. I don't know how many of you have ever been in a situation where it's been uh, very catastrophic or high stress and you don't know where to turn for help. But at that point, uh, trying to look through what it used to be, yellow pages, now at least you can Google for information, correct? But a lot of times you just don't know where to turn. And for myself personally, I ran into that situation in 2008. I had married into a bipolar family and my husband's medicines quit working, and which happens every once in a while. And in the past, it had never been a big thing, but when we tried to get his meds adjusted, it actually took us two years to get him on the appropriate um, medicine. And so with that, going through that period of time, one of the things that we were asked to try were, there was a designer drug that would cost $1,800 a month that wasn't covered by health insurance. Well, remember it was a financial crisis, you had a lot of things going on, my husband wasn't able to work for a couple of years, and we were just under a lot of stress. And with that, I had gone to, um, my church, and I'm very, I'm very involved in my faith-based organization, what to find out since that time um, is that we don't really have that many empty beds in Orange County, right? But I thought, well, of course you do, because I have lived in other communities where you had those kind of resources. So I think the work that Susan has been able to do in the short period of time that she's been here has been incredible, uh, getting these emergency shelters up and running to have places where people can go so that we can begin to triage them and help them get into housing, which is really, really important. Um, with all the work that we have um, done, and once again, with 211, you can just, it's simple for those of you who don't know, you can just dial the number 211, you get connected to us. And for those of you who are parents or grandparents where you have family members call you wanting help with rent and they live in a different part of the country, you can have them dial 211 and they'll get connected to the service in their local area. So it's a really wonderful um, option for everybody to have. Um, but one of the things that we know here in Orange County is that housing uh, that is affordable is not easy to come by. And we've seen that, uh, that gap widen more and more. And while we know we've got the other issues, such as the early release from prison um, and jail that Susan was mentioning, the opioid crisis, mental health issues, the impact of domestic violence, et cetera, one of the things that I think is really important, and especially for you as you go out and you talk to other people about the issue of homelessness, I think it's important to help paint a picture of how easy it is for somebody to slip into homelessness. So I want to share this with you. I think it's, it's a kind of an interesting thing. I took a look at it for myself when I first got out of school. And I got out of school in 1976, and I was living in Denver, and I had a job that paid $6,000 a year, all right? And with that, my available rent for me, I was able to pay $125 a month to rent a top of an old Victorian house, right? So I take a look at it, and that meant that I was spending 25% of my income on housing. Okay, so that's kind of a common number. And then in 1979, I was able to buy a house for $38,500. It's a small house, an old house, but $38,500 uh, on a combined salary with my husband and myself of $46,000. So we were earning more than the cost of the house. In 1994, back in Denver, I moved around the country quite a bit, but I had moved back to Denver just to kind of keep it all apples to apples. And I bought a house for $150,000 on a $150,000 salary. Okay, so you kind of, right? So that still sounds affordable. I moved out to Orange County in 1997, managed to buy a place the very last month on the, on the down cycle before everything started going back up. Bought a house for $220,000 on a $180,000 salary. 
Okay, so it's still kind of in the ball, ballpark. Two years later, I sold that house for $440,000, bought another one that cost the same, happened to be in a little bit better area. It is now worth $1.2 million. My salary hasn't tripled. You know, I mean, and, and I couldn't afford, quite honestly, to live where I'm living today, as is evident so many times as I see Maseratis go down the street now, which we didn't used to have, right? So I think that if we take a look at what's happened in Orange County, where the median home price is $765,000, and that you have to have an income of $158,000 to afford it, it starts painting that picture. When I first started working um, with um, 2110C, the, the, the prior company uh, to that, uh, I remember thinking I had people who were working for me that were making $50,000 a year, they were young, and I couldn't figure out why they were all renting houses with their boyfriend and, a, and another couple. So you'd have four people renting a house. It's like, why would you want to do that? But it's because you can't afford to, to, to live in a house in a neighborhood without doing that. Um, the apartments in Orange County uh, have hit a monthly average of $1,848 per month. Uh, you need $80,700 if you want to work at that same 25% ratio that I mentioned earlier. The annual cost for a single adult with one child is over $60,000 a year. But if you're making, let's say, $15 an hour, which is above the minimum wage, it's $31,200 annually. And one of the things that we have seen a lot of over the last couple of years is that you have people who are falling into homelessness who before might have been able to hold on, but for something catastrophic that's happened, they've had a health issue, uh, their car is broken down, they can't get to work, so therefore they lose their job, right? They go through a divorce, there's domestic violence, a number of different things. And of course, we were hit with the, the economic downturn, and that really, really made a difference. So some of the things that we've seen in, for housing assistance at 211, and by the way, you can go to our website, 2110c.org, and there are a whole lot of reports there, the, the point in time uh, report for the last couple of times is on there. There's a report that shows you the type of calls that we get in by uh, year and by need and by demographics, which would be pretty interesting for you. But our calls for housing assistance have risen by 34% since January, just this year. Uh, calls for emergency shelter have doubled in the last two years. Um, calls from people who are 55 and older have moved from 14% of the calls to almost 20% of the calls. So one of the things that we're very cognizant of is we believe that there is going to be this silver tsunami of people who are going to be losing their housing. We're trying to think of some innovative solutions. We know that we have students who are couch surfing uh, or living in their cars. Is there some way we can connect the people in their houses who might have an extra room, somebody who's widowed, who might be able to rent out a room to a college student. It could be something that could help both of them. Uh, we've seen that within the homeless count that we did, we had a 7.6% increase of people who were homeless. Of the entire group that was homeless, both sheltered and unsheltered, it was just under 4,800 people. 73.5% of them, 73.5% of them were individuals, and 26.5% were families. Of the unsheltered population, and as Susan mentioned, we had had a fairly robust family system of care in Orange County, but not much for the individuals. <clears throat> of the unsheltered population, 97% were adult only, so a lot of individuals. Um, so I think all that is very important. We mentioned the UCI study, uh, which I think is, is something you'll find very, uh, very interesting to read, and I think we've got it connected on our website as well. But a couple of really uh, kind of key things. So often you'll hear people say, well, people who've moved, who are homeless are people who've moved here from someplace else. And what uh, Dave and his team found uh, at UCI 
which was that 68% of the homeless that they surveyed have lived in the county for 10 years or longer. So they've fallen into homelessness. Not all of them, some of them have been homeless the whole 10, 10 years, but many of them have fallen into homelessness. They're, they're predominantly US born individuals, 90%. And the significant share are middle aged, 52% are age 50 or older. Uh, they're non Hispanic white, 47%, male, 57%, and on their own. Uh, so I think that that's a key piece. Uh, the major factors, and this is important as well, the major factors precipitating homelessness are securing or retaining jobs with a sustainable wage. So once again, if you're making $10 an hour, $15 an hour, even $20 an hour, it's really hard to make it here. Um, that's 40% of them have said that that's an issue. Finding and retaining affordable housing, including evictions and foreclosure. And foreclosure. So once again, it's such a hot rental market. If you're a landlord, and you have a chance of renting somebody who's never had an eviction versus somebody who's had an eviction, you know who you're going to rent to, right? So part of the work that we're doing, uh, and they're with, along with the other agencies in the community, is to really develop a relationship with the landlords to do things like have incentives of bonuses to go ahead if they're going to rent to a vet, we can go ahead and get all of our veterans housed. Can we go ahead and do something like that? And just start chipping away. It's really a one one by one type of thing. Uh, family issues, which include domestic violence, family dysfunction, or death of a family member. Um, alcohol or drugs came in fourth. Mental health, 17%. Physical health, 13 And release from jail or prison, 7%. And so part of what we've seen is you have people who are being released out of prison, 2 o'clock in the morning, <laughs> sometimes, and they are out on the street, their families don't want them, or maybe their families aren't even in the area and they don't know where to go, and hence the reason we've seen the growth over at, um, in the downtown Santa Ana. Um, but within all of that, one of the things that was so important with, that Dave's group discovered is that we've spent, and they did such a great job getting participation from, the, from everybody who is impacted from the issue of homelessness, the um, hospitals, um, any of the agencies, the cities, the EMTs, at every the law enforcement to get the cost of homelessness. And it's $299 million a year in Orange County. So I think when we take a look at that number, I've always said if you take a look at that number, I think that there's something in there that can incent us to say, gee, we, we should be able to fix that. Because it comes to a cost of approximately $45,000 per homeless person per year. And we can house people for less money than that. Um, it just, it's really incredible. Um, so part of the work that's being done that I think is really exciting is that we have groups like United Way who are taking a look at what they can do to start getting the civic engagement, the business leaders involved, to really help drive building the affordable housing. And we know it takes time, but I think that um, you know, comments have been made that if you have the top 10 or 20 leaders, business leaders who will sit in a room and you actually have the CEOs sitting in a room, you can get decisions made pretty quickly. And then their staff can go ahead and make sure things happen. So I think we've, we're on the cusp of a lot of good things happening. I, I can't applaud the county um, and Susan's work and the cities who participated in this work to get the emergency shelters up. Uh, and, and going. I think that's a really key piece. Thank you for just a minute. I have a question for you. Yeah. Thank you. Um, almost everyone that I've talked to, and, and a lot of them are in this room, who are working to alleviate homelessness, uh, agree with the housing first approach that's named in the 10 year plan and Susan's plan and so forth. Um, my wife and I have had a number of foster children, and a number of them have come to us out of being in shelters, and they consider themselves homeless, living in a shelter. So talk us through a little bit what it means to be housed, whether living in a shelter feels like you have a home or it's a temporary place. How are we using the term, 
And is someone in a shelter no longer homeless? Or help us think that through. I would call that shelter homeless. So there, there's part of what we get caught up in is there are a lot of HUD definitions, government definitions that are needed so that everybody is talking the same language across uh, the country. But for, uh, for anybody who works in this arena, our goal is to get somebody sheltered into some sort of permanent housing. And so when you hear about terms like housing first, it's like let's get people, in, let's get them housed and give them the services that they need to help them improve their lives or, and, and get to that next point because it's actually better for them and in the long run it ends up being more cost effective for the community. But I think for anybody, at one of the big transitions, um, if you take a look at somebody who's been on the street, and if they've been on the street for a long time, and I'm sure that Brad will be able to speak to this some, it's, I always refer to it with people, it's like post-traumatic stress syndrome. If you don't know where you're gonna lay your head, where you're gonna get a glass of water, where are you gonna have a bathroom break someplace, you don't know where your food's gonna come from, you don't know if somebody's gonna come and hurt you, harm you physically, and you're living in that kind of environment for a long time, it's going to have an impact on you. And so I think part of it, even with going into an emergency shelter, you're, you're in a group of people where you don't know each other necessarily. But you'll find situations where people can be housed, and they'll get into housing, and they won't sleep on their bed for six months because they're not used to it.